Well, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Jim Gary. And um, I got to meet, I had the honor of meeting Dr. Gary as I was attending some courses at Las Vegas Institute. And um, during my course last year, it's a two-part course, so in August, uh, I was very excited that in, when I returned in September, I was going to get to hear Dr. Gary, and somebody had said, well, you probably, he won't be at the lecture, most likely because he's had a stroke and he can't talk. And I was, one, very disappointed that I wouldn't get to hear him, as well as horrified at what had happened to him. But when I came back in September, there he was lecturing. And a man who was told that he was basically never going to talk again two months later had recovered from a stroke. And I truly, because of his love of teaching and communicating what he has to show to you today, it literally cured him. He loves to teach. And you're going to see. <laughs> And, you know, the amazing thing is when they were doing diagnostic tests on him, they found that he'd had like 30 to 50 TIAs and never even had any symptoms of them whatsoever. Um, so I will tell you that Dr. Gary, sometimes he gives a great lecture, but every once in a while there's a word that he kind of gets stuck on. And that tends to bother him, but I told him I don't think it's a big deal because he's looking at someone that walks all the way downstairs in their house, opens the door to the refrigerator, and I can't figure out for the life of me why I'm standing there for 10 minutes. So he's, I think he's doing just wonderful, and he's had a wonderful life. He's been doing this since 1954, and uh, just has some wonderful pictures to show you. So I'm really honored to introduce Dr. Jim Gary. Read this? Yeah, read that. But I didn't bring my glasses. Okay. Okay. James F. Gary, DDS, is a general dentist practicing in Fullerton, California. He's an expert in the diagnosis and treatment of craniomandibular disorders. He has extensively studied the effects of upper airway obstruction on and oral facial development. Dr. Gary has been awarded seven fellowships, holds two masterships, and is immediate past president of the International College of Craniomandibular Orthopedics. Uh, you have tremendous teaching credentials here. Look at all of these. University of Pacific, University of New Jersey, West Virginia University, University of Southern California. In addition, he has made numerous international presentations on craniomandibular orthopedics and upper airway obstruction in Germany, Italy, England, all over the world. You're well traveled. Uh, and he has many publications. He has three books. Um, and I would direct you out there, but I looked at the books on the table and somebody's bought all three sets, so they're not even out there for you to peruse unless whoever bought them wants to show them around. So <laughs> I introduce Dr. Jim Gary to you. Okay, let me get you. Put this in your pocket. And let me see if I can get you all hooked up here. I think that's going to work. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, many of my colleagues want to know why I chose dentistry as a profession. Here I am in my late 70s, still practicing full time, 32 hours a week. In World War II, I was a bombardier on a B-17, flew, flew three missions and shot down all three times. Wow. <laughs> Last time. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, my God, yes. When I think of the, the B-17s, just to talk, uh, cost, I, I uh, finally wound up finding that I owe them money. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I heard they had to come to yours because you know where the slides are. You're right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, yes. Oh, gee. Anyway, in my, my second year in dental school, USC, uh, I w was down in the basement reading a bulletin board. And it was an orthodontist who'd written a uh, communication where he wanted to see if who wanted to participate in the development of the Nooksauger nipple. And uh, he's going to pay for it. And uh, well, since my wife was pregnant, uh, and she's Roma's over here, uh, in fact, at the very end of the table, I'll have her stand for a minute here. <laughs> uh, anyway. You're going to see the, uh, the child on her breast. You're going to see her breast. You're going to sit, she sits there with her smile on her face, but she's uh, 
really uh, trying to, uh, well, I, I breastfeed now. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. Uh, first of all, uh, I participated in this program developing the Nuxager nipple based upon my child's, uh, on, on her breast, uh, configure, his oral configuration on her breast. You're going to see that in a moment. Uh, our form and our functions develop by, by what we do in our mouth. If we're tongue thrusters, hey, do we have volume in our mouth for our tongue? No, we don't have. Do we have upper airway obstruction? Yes, you do have. Uh, so that's what would, would cause the arches to underdevelop, to have micronathia rather than macronathia. Upper airway obstruction and upper airway deformities. Why is occlusion so unstable? Oh, by golly, US LVI, we want to have it stable. Uh, based upon the 32 crowns we're putting on. Uh, 32 crowns on good teeth? My God, half. Most of uh, Bill Dickerson's patients are dentists who want to look better. And he does their crowns all in one visit with temporaries, naturally. <laughs> <laughs> naturally. And so what he's done, he's, he's got this uh, material that he puts on over the teeth. Uh, prior to his preparation, and then he fills it up with this material that uh, is, uh, looks like your teeth, but is uh, a veneer, okay, temporary veneer, okay? This presentation will cover those deformities that result from obstruction and will teach the dentist to recognize chronic nasal blockade and growth changes in the craniofacial structures that are environmentally induced. Every patient's a neuromuscular patient. Yes, indeed, Eo. In fact, you all are neuromuscular patients. This is Janet Travell. In fact, she was in an audience that, that when I was, uh, I made the comment that 80% of all head pain was muscular. And she came up afterwards, and I thought she was a, a, a maid. Uh, and I said, are you here to clean the podium up? She says, no, I'm here to correct you. And I said, what, what do you mean? <laughs> she says, take that 80% and make it 90%. And I said, oh, oh, oh What's your name? She said, Janet Travell. I said, my God, if I'd have known you were in the audience, I could not have lectured to these medical doctrines. And so she uh, became a patient of mine. I made her an orthotic, which was a removable uh, appliance, like a splint. And uh, it's made it a neuromuscular trajectory on the, where the muscles fire evenly on both sides after they're relaxed. And she, she changed her vertical and her, her AP uh, came forward and, and down. In other words, you don't, you, you're not on a hinge axis. The moment you open, you translate. You ever, anyone know about the hinge axis? Okay. The moment you open, you translate. The moment you put an orthotic in there, you translate. If you don't believe me, take a tomograph before and after you place an orthotic. And look at the distance between the distal the condyle and the external lot of trameatus. So anyway, uh, I learned about tongue thrust working with Baltars, who passed away, by the way. All my dentist friends have passed away. I'm the only one who hasn't. Um, some people think I'm standing up here, passed away, but uh, <laughs> I don't. So this presentation is going to cover the deformities that result from obstruction, and will teach the dentist to recognize chronic nasal blockade and growth changes of craniofacial structures that are environmentally influenced, resulting in occlusal instability. Every patient has malocclusion to some degree. Teeth are not set in stone. There is a dynamic relationship between tooth position, the shape, art shape, and mandibular posture. When the pathologic position exceeds our accommodative capacity, we begin to complain of pain, discomfort, and or aesthetics. We all have the ability to exist in a, an accommodative <coughs> pathologic position. Let's demonstrate. My goal is to give you an insight into the environmental uh, influences on the development of malocclusion, uh, which 
and, and reconstruction to intercept and develop the treatment plan, we should begin immediately postpartum and continue evaluating our patients throughout life. Now, we spend four years in the mouth. We can't look up a nose. Come on. You can't tell whether the nose is deviated or not. You can't look in an ear. I do. When they come in, they complain of ear aches and, and uh, subjective hearing loss. I look and, and I listen and I look and I, I look for cerumen, for otitis media, and I refer them out to the ear, nose, and throat specialist, not trying to treat them myself. Now, I'm going to have you all sit up straight and let your mandible drop. That's your lower jaw. And don't try to bite on your back teeth. Let it float up. And the very first tooth that initially touches point two, initially touches, just float it up. Okay, there you are, there you are, there you are, there you are, there you are. Oh, wow, now you're, you're interesting because I've never had anyone do this before. Uh, you're even on both sides. Now, look around, hold your fingers up there and look around at, at these patients. And those of you that have, are doing this are distally displaced, displaced backwards, but you're living in an accommodated pathologic position. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. Oh, we, myofascial pain dysfunction, TMJ, TMD, TMJ, TMD, myo, myofascial uh, pain, or musculoskeletal dysfunction, temporomandibular. We're living in an alphabet soup syndrome. The oral surgeon think, thinks it's your joint. OBGY says it's a premature syndrome premenstrual syndrome. <laughs> and the neurologist says it's an impaired neural pathway. The nutritionist says it's junk food. Podiatrist says it's your feet, and it can be your feet. Uh, it's, uh, the physical therapist, is, it's your posture. Psychologist, it's your stress. And in USC, we didn't want to take these TMJ patients because they're stressed. They were all stressed. But that's not what caused their problem. Their problem was malocclusion and the stress brought out the pain. Uh, the ear, nose, and throat specialist says it's your ear. Septum turbinates. Allergist says it's chronic allergies. Frankly, I don't know as a general family practitioner. And of course, the dentist at LVI says it's your bite. The neuromuscular under, uh, dentist understands that the etiology of head and neck pain can result from numerous pathologic conditions and requires a multidisciplinary approach to treatment. Who is the first one I send my patients to? Ear, nose, and throat specialist. I had to educate them. I took them out to dinner, to lunch. And dinners cost more money. Uh, <laughs> and I explained to them what my uh, problem was. And I asked them if they were willing to solve it. And they, those who seemed disinterested, I didn't send my patients to. But out of 20 guys, I had two that said, hey, I believe you, Dr. Gary. I'm going to do your TNA on every patient you send me as soon as I diagnose it. Well, I treat anybody that comes into my <laughs> office. I've watched them develop class one malocclusion. Class two, division one, division two, class three, malocclusions. Oh yes, I have. Here's where it begins. It begins in utero. And in utero, why would they start sucking these little digits that form? Well, there they are. They're sucking on them. But the fetus swallows from about 12 weeks of gestation. So for 28 weeks, the gustatory system is exposed to chemicals in the amniotic fluid. Chemicals include in the amniotic fluid glucose, fructose, lactic acid, peruvic citric acids, fatty acids, phospholipids, creatinine, urea, uric acid, polypeptides, and proteins, and salts. Boy, did you know that? Man, well, there are gradual short term changes in the amniotic fluid composition due to the fetus urinating into the fluid. The volume ranges from 170 three milliliters a day to 677 milliliters a day. The last third of gestation, the fetus swallows large volumes of amniotic fluid ranging from 200 milliliters a day <coughs> to 760 milliliters a day. At the beginning of the urine test, yes. What? At the beginning of the urine test, 
therapy. You're in therapy. Yeah, that's it. That's <laughs> oh, you're so good. You're just <laughs> son of a gun. <laughs> At birth, you don't have an oral pharynx. You got an oral cavity. Why is that? Well, the upper airway anatomy of the human newborn approximates that of anatomy of primates. There's a close approximation and locking of the uvula and epiglottis, which allows for simultaneous sucking of milk. Have you ever noticed a baby sucking and breathing? And so breathing. And the tongue remains entirely within the nor oral cavity, eliminating the oral pharynx. So for the first six months, children and infants are obligate nose breathers. They can't breathe through their mouth. For the first six months of life, the, uh, well, it's a result of the epiglottis, which is supposed to be down here, or winding up here. So if you look in the mouth, you, you're, you'll, not see any, you'll not see the back of the throat. You're going to see the epiglottis. Contact between the epiglottis and soft palate provides a uh, soft palate at birth provides a channel from the external nares and and of course the food is uh, without well, food passes on either side of the interlocked larynx uh, and, and pharynx so through isthmus fossium so fossium is, is the isthmus on either side of the tongue that uh, the child uses to swallow. During the first approximately 18 months, full postpartum, the laryngeal complex migrates from its original subcranial position to lie opposite the fifth cervical vertebra, eliminating the interdigitation between the soft palate and the epiglottis. So here we are down here, and here's the soft palate up here. And look at this. What, a, what an area for obstructive sleep apnea. Uh-huh, you betcha it is. Again, new, uh, at birth, and at, at uh, 16 months or 17 months, uh, it drops down. In fact, it, might, it drops down constantly from birth to ab about six months, and that's when you can breathe through your mouth and, uh, n and choke really on the food. So what do we got here? We got airway bypassing the, the trachea down into the, uh, down into the uh, lungs, and then the food bypassing it because it can't, it, uh, it, if you swallow it, where it crosses over here, the food goes into the trachea. All right, thank God for the nasal cycle. What the hell's a nasal cycle? Well, uh, every two to three hours, one side of your nose is engorges with blood, and the other side backs off. That's why I, I think that's why. In fact, I'm, sh I'm almost positive that that's why we turn over to become symmetrical. But nobody is symmetrical. Nobody here is symmetrical. Those of you that did this, and those of you that did this are asymmetric. Uh, and in fact, if you're ever down towards uh, San Diego, before you get to the zoo, there's a science center there. And go inside and find that unit that where you put your chin in the middle, and then you see your right side with your left side, your right side with your right side, your left side with your left side, and the way people see you and the way you see yourself. You'll see four different people. Four different people. Again, here's a three months old, it's trying to breathe through his mouth. I took a, a swab, s swabbed the nose, sent it into the lab, and found a four plus eosinophilia. Well, fortunately, she was on cow's milk, which is the most allergenic food known to man. <coughs> mouth breathing occurs when nasal airway flow is diminished. This usually occurs when goblet cells and also mucus cells in the nose react to allergens producing inspissated secretions. The thick secretion reduces cilia locomotion. Now, the cilia function 10 to 20 times a second as a sheet. The thick secretion reduces cilia locomotion, re re resulting in bacterial stagnation in the nasal passages. That's like the kid who the mother said, well, my kid has got constant earaches. 
And I said, well, gee, uh, why don't you have the adenoids taken out? Well, my doctor seemed to think they're necessary. Pediatricians believe that they're necessary, even though they start invaginating at five years of age and are gone by the time you're through puberty. So the thick secretion of reduced cilia locomotion results in bacterial stagnation in the bacteria in the nasal cavities. There's a picture I want you to burn into your brain. Look at the child's mouth on the breast. That's my wife's breast, by the way. Uh, yeah, <laughs> hooray, hooray, hooray. Uh, and of course, we're not going to talk about the emotion. We're, go we're going to leave that to the psychologists and psychiatrists. But you know that we do get some emotional st uh, re uh, relationship between the mother and the child and the infant. But look at the side of the mouth, the modiolus. Look at the way this buccinator mechanism, and you're going to sign, we're going to show you what that is, uh, affects the uh, growth of the, the maxilla. The maxilla is like clay, and it will react to it forces, and will react to uh, the, amount, the what you put in the, the mouth, the nipple, the thumb, the finger, two fingers, three fingers. I'd rather have it three fingers than two fingers. Uh, three fingers are spread the tongue out sideways and don't, don't uh, create any abnormality within the intrinsic muscles of the tongue. This is our contribution to TMJ, to Micronathia, to the orthodontist. The orthodontist says, hey, I want him to be on that. I'm going to wind up with a narrow upper arch, micronathia, and a n narrow lower arch, micronathia. Well, we'll show you how that occurs. Primary origin of, of habits, oral habits are in, one, instinct, two, bottle feeding instead of breastfeeding, not fatiguing the sucking reflex, upper airway obstruction, allergies, but the secondary results become satisfying habit like smoking, and is evident when the child is angry, hungry, tired, frightened, in pain or discomfort, and can result from imitation. They see their brother and sister doing it. Breastfeeding off antibodies offer a remarkable protection against respiratory infections such as flu, pneumonia, which are accompanied by a fever. Dr. Arthur Nigeria. Uh, Saint Uni in 1964, this Saint uh, um, Louis University used to have a dental school. Concluded that breastfed children show excellent, and more desirable facial features than bottle-fed children. Human milk contains uh, now. Th here's a colostrum. M immune, uh, immune globulin A protects against gastrointestinal disorders. Lysozyme, an antimicrobial enzyme. Nitrogen contains sac polysaccharides, the bifidus factor, promotes the growth of bifidobacteria flora, and uh, the, these bacteria lower the pH in the intestinal tract, and an acid environment inhibits the growth of Escherichia coli, yeast, and Shigella, and lactoferrins inhibits the growth of Staphylococci by binding E. coli, by, uh, by uh, binding iron, which bacteria need for, uh, re to require to proliferate. A fatty acid that appears to have an anti-staphylococcal factor and lactoperoxidase combats streptococci. Have you ever heard uh, of you know what's good example that if the uh, child is not breastfed in the first 12 hours of uh, birth, there's something in the mother's colostrum for the birth in process that triggers uh, the establishment of the gastric digestive Never have. I've, I've checked that correlation with a lot of chronically ill patients, and to this day, they end up with low hydrocyclic enzymes. Later in life, you know, sit in stage for low thyroid function, heart disease, cancer, etc. But it was an observation of a nature path for 70 years. Hmm. I don't know how he observed that, but I've looked at all of my patients, and I found it really is an amazing correlation. So I tell all my pregnant patients or, or women or, or people having babies, make sure you breastfeed, especially when they have C sections where they're anesthetized. Where they're maybe taken away or they're having difficult deliveries. Never heard that one. No, never have. Never have. Ask your patients on that. 
Yeah. Yeah. Chronically ill, and you'll find out they have nothing for anybody to talk about. Uh, I'll, and I'll bet you're right. I know it. Okay. Human. Uh, the biochemical difference. In human milk contains a rich supply of nucleotides, substances involved in protein and nucleic acid synthesis. The fatty acid composition of substitutes of human milk varies appreciably from that of human milk. And lipase, an enzyme that enhances the availability of free fat fatty acid, is present in large amounts in human milk. <coughs> oh, good. It's like going. You got it. Uh, <coughs> now, the, the proportion of the uh, of the proteins in our uh, milk are have been uh, a, a constant. For example, the percentage of protein in, in human milk, which is this here, 40 to 60, and in cow's milk, casein is twice the amount as in human milk. That's the result <coughs> of, that's the cause of an allergy. And that's the cause of colic. Okay? Now, th this down here, Calcium and, and, and phosphorus relationship to each other is 340 uh, per, um, per liter to 140 of uh, phosphorus. Whereas in the cow's milk, to build hoofs and horns, so if you want a horny kid, <laughs> give him cow's milk. Uh, yeah, a little <laughs> You're right. Allergies to cow milk have been associated with difficulty in initiating, maintaining sleep in infants. Infants diagnosed as insomniacs developed normal sleep patterns after cow's milk was eliminated from the diet. And insomnia reappeared when infants were challenged with cow's milk. Again, we're going to talk about mothers saying, I can't breastfeed because my, my tip, the tips of my nipples are sore. Well. I just tell them, hey, wait, I've got something for you. And it's a breast shield. And oh, it has a, a air a vent here and a vent here. But this here should not be, there's Massey cream was, was what, uh, one of the things you th you, that I had the women order to put on their breasts. Well, mother came in the other day and she said, uh, well, I laughed last year and said that I'm using vitamin E oil and that that is equivalent to breastfeed fit um, mass a cream mass a cream is is a um, a lubricant oh and then I you know what I don't know I've used it for years though Okay, now here's my wife. Now, this is the old pump that we used to have. I understand that t today and uh, th we've got electric pumps, and you can do both breasts at one time. Well, um, we, we, we're, we threw this one away. Caution, do not pour fresh milk onto frozen milk before cooling. Always date the milk, as it must be used within two weeks. Conventional nipples and pacifiers should be avoided if we're to provide a, an infant with a neuromuscular pattern that approximates that of a breastfed infant. The NUK, N-U-K, nipple and exerciser is the best substitute. This is what we stick down the child's mouth. We'll open up the tip of this so they'll, they, they won't have to keep them there when on the bottle for any length of time. And it doesn't fatigue the sucking reflex. And it will actually drown the child. If you've ever seen a drowning child, it's a child coming with milk coming out the side of his mouth. Oh, there's four more benefits to breastfeeding. It's no need to boil it. Cats can't steal it. <laughs> available when, when necessary. And it's available in attractive containers now. <laughs> now that's the young gals in here. My wife, nah, she throws it over her shoulder and I breastfeed from the back. <laughs> Again, these muscles here affect the, the arch development. The, the, there's no lateral growth there. And the tongue doesn't support the inside of the teeth. So tongue needs proprioceptive response against the teeth, of the, the lingual surfaces of the teeth. The head of an infant is approximately one quarter of his or her height, whereas the head of an adult is one eighth of his or her total height. 
The portion of leg length, the total st stature in infants is approximately 35% of the total height, whereas in adults, it increases to 50%. This phenomenon is known as differential growth. In the newborn, the cranium is eight to nine times larger than the facial portion. The relationship is changed by differential growth to the extent that the face is approximately 50% of the adult cranium. So, airway can affect facial growth. The skull can be divided into two major structures, the cranium and the facial portion. Okay? Now, the facial portion comprises a maxilla, maxillary and mandibular dental alveolar portions of the skull. Growth in the brain case, or calvarium, correlates to growth in the brain itself, whereas growth in the facial masculatory muscle is what we do. We put that in the thumb in the mouth, finger in the mouth, pacifier in the mouth, and we, we, uh, we, 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 we can affect somatic growth. During the four, first four years of postpartum, Growth and development is, is often adversely affected by environmental influence resulting in oral facial deformities. During the first five months of life, an infant's weight doubles. This never occurs in such a short period of time. In the first three years of life, the infant's height doubles. This never occurs in such a short period of time. By the age of four, the cranium is 60% of the adult size. By the age of 12, it's 90% of the adult size. At birth, we have no glenoid fossa. We have uh, just the flat ar auricular tubercle, okay? That's so they can bring the jaw forward, latch onto mother's areola, and then with back and forth motion, bring the milk uh, down for the letdown. But by the age of two, the front teeth are, have erupted and you, you're getting the characteristic adult profile. Again, we're going three dimensions from here to here to here. Now, at birth, our mandible is distalized. And I, gosh dang, I remember my wife saying, well, now, your son has got a retruded chin. Uh, what can you do about it? So I went down to the orthodontic department, which was in the basement of USC, and it's on the third floor now. Uh, and asked them, I knocked on the door, and they opened the door, and are you a student here, a graduate student? I said, no, I'm a student. Well, the, they, they clo closed the door in my face. Fortunately, I had in my car, riding with me, a student to save money in the orthodontic department. And he, cr he showed me one thing, and that's the mandible goes down at twice the rate of the maxilla, coming forward, down and forward. So what should we have? Well, one to one, subnathion to subnasale, subnasale to gabella, and gabella to trichion. Now trichion is kind of tricky with men. They should be in thirds, okay? Now, here's my son. And you know, I couldn't think of an appliance that I could put in there to bring his mandible forward. In fact, I had to put him to sleep to do it. But we do go down and forward. OK? Now, what's the nasolabial line angle? That's this angle from here to here. There's only two things that grow all your life. It's your ears and your nose. I wish there were three. <laughs> Here's an optimal nasal lang line angle when I got into USC. But look at me now, the way I changed. Now, look at the nose here and here. The ALR cartilages drop. And those of you that want to get proper oxygen, just take your fingers and pull sideways here one millimeter <coughs> and watch them and breathe in and breathe out. Now breathe out without, breathe in and out without it. So up here by the liminal valve, it's where the nasal bone contacts the, uh, the, the septum. And again, there we go. 
Now, neuromuscular occlusion, what is that? Well, that's when you've relaxed all the muscles of mastication, you verify it with EMG recordings, and you give them a millimeter of freeway space along a, a relaxed trajectory. How do you determine the relaxed trajectory? By pulsing them with the TENS unit on one side, negative to negative, positive on the back. So you, well, if you've got a TENS unit and you've got two, two, uh, a, 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 two electrodes on one side, it's positive to negative, and your body will pick that up. Now, would you never change vertical? Come on. How about that face? And that's at a neuromuscular position. Never increase vertical? Come on. And that's at a neuromuscular position with a millimeter of freeway space. Again, look at this guy here. You're going to leave him this way here? Or are you going to show him? You're going to make a neuromuscular orthotic? Look at that. Isn't that, and he's biting down on his orthotic. Again, there it is, there it is, there is his, look at this chin and the fold in here, deep labial mental fold. Oh, we have our measurements, sure, we have a lot of them. Normal facial measurements, profile measurement, your face is supposed to be one third and third and a third. Your eyes are supposed to be one fifth of your width of your face. But, what are you going to do? Well, we're going to take that buccinator mechanism, which is the orbicularis oris, or orbicularis oris buccinator and superior constrictor muscle. We've got a band around our upper, upper teeth that's always pulling in lingually. And what offsets that lingual pull? The tongue. That yeah, tongue does. you damn right it does. So you've got to have a balance between the tongue and the cheeks. Now. How many of you wake up with a dry mouth in the morning? You're, dry, you're dying, you know that, don't you? <laughs> you're dying. You won't live to be 100. You may live to be 90. <laughs> but you're going to live to be 100 if you, if you uh, don't get in an accident or you don't catch a disease, debilitating disease. But you stay normal. You guys are n you, and you wake up tired in the morning, don't you? All of you that mouth breathe are going to be tired in the morning because oxygen is what's necessary to get a good night's smooth sleep. And the sleep apnea is a cessation of breathing for 10 seconds or longer, more than five times an hour. So if you hear this. Not yet, not yet. Because, oh. Right. Anything that, when you sleep on your back, you've got a good chance of sleep apnea. Because when you go to sleep, the mandible drops back against the back of the throat. And the tongue impinges on that posterior pharyngeal wall. Right? So that if you've got an appliance, though, that you can put in there at night to prevent that mandible from going back, do it. And if it's successful, print it because I'm in the middle of my sleep apnea of patients now. And uh, I'm, wh what I'm doing is I'm making an upper and a lower of appliance with an end-to-end -end bite. And they bite into that. And if they open up their mouth, they're still in it. It's got flanges on the lingual surfaces of those teeth. So it's interesting because they found out the gas, the ear, the gas CO2 oxygen studies. They want to find out where the ideal sleep position on your back, your front, or your side. They found on side and left side, they get the maximum oxygen gas intake to the body. And they Skype tape. And I've done I wear my flash and I Skype tape and look at the other. Because I still mouth breathe with my flash in the mouth. Well, yours is probably in, in the nose itself. Probably not a little one. You, you betcha, baby. I'd send you to the ear, nose, and throat specialist immediately. Anyway, uh, he's when he's got his appliance in there, he still mouth breathes, okay? He puts tape across his mouth and ha is forced to breathe through his nose, right? Yeah. But I mean, they, this was a recommendation of the protocol to change the sleep pattern to just take a little uh, tape. I got to put fun, and I, I read it, it works to take the soft, long sleep apnea also for patients. It's a very interesting thing. It's called 
Breathing Easy by Teresa Neal. Hale, Hale. Oh, Hale, H-A-L-E. H-A-L-E. And, uh, breathing Freely. Breathing Freely. Is that what it is? Yeah. Okay, Breathing Freely. And, and she, it was adapted from, what's the name, it's Bukowski or Brzezinski or from Russia. He did 50 years of sleep studies. It's brilliant work. Just brilliant. Good. Good. Good for you. Yeah. Okay. Again, here's the buccinator superior constrictor and posterior pharyngeal wall and posterior rafe. This is where this, you, you've got this uh, encompassing of the upper arch in this, in this uh, mechanism called the buccinator mechanism. The tongue itself has intrinsic muscles in it which are stimulated by the teeth. And if, you've got, uh, if you want to see w- uh, wh- how an open bite w- can occur, just let, let a mouth breathe, but have the arch the same. Or the, uh, you can look in the mouth, and, and the arch appears to be a horseshoe instead of the typical V, in, uh, narrow da- uh, narrowed arch, micronathia. The palate is real high on these kids. What happens when their tongue's up there, the palate drops. So the septum of the nose will, uh, it will drop, and it won't become deviated. So if they're, ma- if they're uh, chronic mouth breathers, you got a high V vault, you got a nasal obstruction in that area at least half the night, because half the time, half the night, you're uh, engorged with blood in the turbinates. Again, why the retruded chin? Well, all these muscles here, super and infrahyoid muscles, Lift your, you're lifting your head up, but you, you're not going to keep it up. You're going to come forward, okay? Airway obstructed kids come forward, and that's a typical picture of glossoptosis. So retruded chin, high V vault, narrow arches, micronathia is your uh, airway obstruction is your clue. Now here's some work uh, done by Eagle Harvold. Severe overjet and, and overbite developed when the monkey lowered his jaw mandible and uh, maintain the tongue in a more retruded position. In the course of this experience, how many of you have seen uh, and removed upper tori? Yeah, you have, and you have, okay. Now, it's different on the lower. It's buttressing bone on the lower. However, on the upper, the, uh, in the course of this experiment here, where he put in this real large tori palatini, the histologic sections show healthy muscle fibers in a deviant order, order, orientation. Stimulation of the posterior part of the tongue made it narrower and pointed. And this is the beginning of the experiment, and this is the end of the experiment. Notice that uh, in there uh, it being narrower than that. Yeah, it's uh, biting on inclined planes, tori mandibular eye. So if you di- if you're going to take care of them, you got to equilibrate that patient on the lower teeth on the inclined planes. At a neuromuscular position. After mouth breathing, nine to twelve months, the shape of the tongue has been changed. The uvula is visible, apparently because of the tongue being thinner in that region, and the midsection is bulkier than the, than the and the tip is more pointed. Again, here, and look at the convolutions inside that tongue. Uh, muscles of the tongue, uh, muscle tonus of the tongue is maintained when, when uh, mouth breathing in an animal is uh, anesthetized with ketamine. The tongue moves in rhythm with the respiration, and the mouth is kept open. And a control animal though, can't do this. The shape of the tongue and behavior of the tongue may change dramatically when respiration is shifted from nose to mouth breathing. In this animal, B, here. In this animal, uh, when respiration is uh, shifted from the nose to the mouth, the width of the tongue reduced 50% as the tongue turned long and narrower after a nine-month period. The, the tongue in the rhesus monkey has been reduced several months elapsed before the position of the tongue adjusted to the new stimuli from the tongue. 
The reduction of the tongue caused a corresponding reduction of the dental arches and the incisor and a deeper overbite and a deeper bite. An open, mouth, open bite developed when the tongue assumed a more anterior position. So all the oh, times you have them bite down and you see this oh, spacing between the teeth, it's the tongue causing it. And the, the open bite. Again, this is it, uh, high palate. Again, this is a sleep apneic patient and he is no longer sleep apneic. Here's a four bicuspid extraction case. Look at the volume you've lost when you take out those bicuspids. This is by, with the bicuspids in on this, on, on this uh, twin. So which one do you think is the tongue thruster? The one with, on the left or the right? The one on your right. Again, despite protestations from pediatricians, clinical investigators have failed to demonstrate Significant changes in the immunologic status of the patients following a tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. Almond masses, palatine tonsils, the back of the throat. How many of you ever look at, the, examine the back of the throat? Yay, everybody in here, then. son of a gun. And uh, these almond-shaped masses here are between palatal glossal muscle and the posterior palatal uh, a little pharyngeal muscle. This is the back of the tongue. The back of the tongue has got lymph, uh, lingual tonsils on them. Okay, collection of lymph follicles located at the root of the tongue. If when you look in the mouth you you see this, or you take your lateral ceph, and you see that uh, tongue being enlarged in here, send them to the ear, nose, and throat specialist, please, and have it scraped off because that's how they remove the adenoids in the back of the throat high. Back here are, are tonsils, and we got ling lingual tonsils there. Now, adenoid, the soft palate's been displaced superiorly with the retractor, displaying a large mass of adenoid tissue on the posterior pharyngeal wall of the nasal pharynx. In other words, you look in here with a camera, you, you, you see in the back of my throat, and the back of my throat's coming towards you, and as it gets, toward you, you lose your air. You lose air. Okay. Remember, these are adenoids now. And uh, view from the, the adult. Uh, inside the nose here, you're going to view it. And uh, how many of you have, got, have learned to look in the nose? No. Then that's what I'm... I, I've got to, I've got to a introduce this at uh, LVI. I've got to. Um, when you use a nasal speculum, you don't turn it sideways. You you pull it, you pull it this way, not that way. Uh, you don't look up the nose. You look behind the nose. You don't. You push on the tip of the nose. See where the septum comes out of the nose, the side of the nose. It's a deviated septum. And remember this, when that thing gets that m massive and you got your pharynx in here, that's where your air has to go. And in your lateral ceph, you're going to see this. And so you want all, you want all that scraped off. Be be space between here and here is narrower, and so they cr wind up chronically mouth breathing. Oh yeah, I, I believe it firmly. That's an allergic response. Absolutely. No, with surgery you you don't want. You, I've never had a patient in 26 years regret having taken the tonsils out. Okay, acute hemorrhagic tonsillitis. You've all, all worked on them. You've never looked in the back of the throat. Hypertrophy of the palatine tonsils shows marked erythema, edema, retrotonsillar er tissue, including the soft palate. Again, notice what that does to the tongue. Notice how that tongue is down and away from that, that uh, hypertrophy tonsil. And look at the arch. This orthodontist had put in a lingual arch wire, and he couldn't get it to change. And he sent the patient to me because he knew I, he heard that I had success at it. Well, I just told him I'm sending this out to the ear, nose, and throat specialist, and you can take them off the, the lingual arch off the lower and watch it develop normally. 
again, chipping, bicuspid drop off. Here, this here is caused by the tongue laying between the teeth, causing a, a premature contact between these that patient there that who's overclosed. Again, notice how that t t is t <laughs> these tonsils have taken this upper arch here and and veed it instead of making a horseshoe out of it. It's made it veed, and that patient lisped, and he, he stopped lisping when I got him back. Again, tonsillectomy, but look at the t grooves are here on the teeth. That's in crossbite. Notice the tongue is in the arch, lower arch, the lower arch being developed bigger than the upper arch. What have you got? Class three bite. All class threes have a lower arch that's bigger than an upper arch. Again, you just have them open and say, ah, you see this? But you gag them a little bit and you're gonna see that. Involution, in, in, these have been involuted. Again, that's what you're gonna see. And that's the mouth and the, the, the teeth in, the, in their, uh, and the posterior occlusion. Again, crossbite develops, An anterior open bite, teeth are in the crossbite back here. Uh, you've got the tonsils here and, and, and probably the adenoids. But look here, this is where the tongue lays over the teeth when they erupt. They don't erupt all the way. There's a tongue laying on the top of the teeth. What, the, what, what happens to curve of speed? It becomes excessive, doesn't it? Bite down, bite down. And now they, they're pulling the tongue out of the way and they, they're overclosed and distally displaced. Because when you close, your condyle goes back. When you open, your condyle comes forward. Again, four years in orthodontic treatment could not close an open bite. Tongue thruster. Okay, no, we're going to talk about what are the signs you're going to see on these kids. Well, you're going to see overclosure like you do on the, uh, like you did on the adult, but you're going to see a dolicocephalic face, a long face, open mouth habitus, low lower dry lip, arched upper lip, nasal orifice is narrow, narrow, disuse, labial mental fold is uh, deep, and that's the labial mental fold. Note, dolicocephalic face, which is a long face, okay? Narrow orifice disuse, didn't use his nose at all. Open mouth habitus, chronic mouth breather. Arched upper lip, rolled lower dry lip, deep labial mental fold, Steep mandibular plane angle. Chronic contracture of the mentalis muscle. And the adult, you're going to say the same thing. But there's a girl who'd had four bicuspids removed. And what I'm finding is that I've got to, when I widen that arch, I've got to put four bridges back in there. Otherwise, I'm, I can't gain room, bogging for that tongue. So, does she look ill? Yes, she does. She have allergic shiners? Yes, she does. She have an open mouth habitus? Yes, she does. She have a dry ro lo roll lower lip? Dry but not rolled. Arched upper lip? Long silky eyelashes? Dolicocephalic face? Allergic shiners? Narrow, uh, narrow uh, nasal orifice disuse? Open mouth habitus? Chronic mouth breather? Arched upper lip? Deep mandibular plane angle, micronathia, class two four bicuspid extraction case, and a deep overbite. Deep overbite. Now, if you got a patient like this and you got him in the chair and you see him like this and you come back and he looks like that, there's a guy that that uh, had sleep apnea, and I. Uh, I on my examination form, I asked him if they ever wake up with a dry mouth in the, in the morning, and his answer would have been yes, I do. So, what do I do on him? I do ortho. 
First of all, I got to get them out of the uh, CPAP, which is a continuous positive airway pressure ga unit, uh, CPAP, and uh, make sure that he's, um, he can breathe at night through his nose. Look at these kids here. They're allergic to cow's milk. And I took them off of cow's milk and, oh, of course, this. Um, and they this all disappeared over uh, and in six months they were mouth breath uh, uh, nose breathing now what's going to happen when you uh, need air you're going to lift your head up aren't you that's the first thing we learn in CPR but if you if C1 tubercle attaches to C to occiput and we haven't been forward, and there's no separation. Actually, there's supposed to be nine millimeters, nine to 10 millimeters between these two. And uh, you got it uh, fused. You better let the mother know that she's had air se se severe airway obstruction and has had to lift their head up forward. And uh, the reason they can't, uh, I used to send them to a neurologist, but they, there's nothing they can do for it. They just said, just to keep them, tell them to stay out of accidents. Uh, Otherwise, they're going to be paralyzed. Again, here's C1 and C2 and occiput. C2 and C3 are fused. Bend your head forward. No separation. So that's from airway obstruction. We do not breathe through each nostril evenly, which can affect airway obstruction. And uh, eventually will, uh, will affect uh, if it terminates hypertrophy. Turbinates have a nasal cycle every two to three hours, make mucus blanket covering the turbinates on one side and gorges with blood. Enlarging the turbinate after two to three hours, engorgement diminishes and the cycle shifts to the other side. And that's so we we'll turn over in our sleep. Not, not, uh, it not characteristic of anything other than that. Twenty minutes? No. Right. <coughs> okay. Turbinates. Deviated septum. Look at that septum. How it's deviated. It's not straight up and down. But is this hypertrophy turbinates or is it vasomotor rhinitis? Well, hypertrophy has to be surgically uh, removed. Vasomotor rhinitis can be handled with, so with uh, corticosteroid nasal sprays. Again, is this vasomotor rhinitis? Put in some Afrin, wait five minutes, and then take another picture, and it's not, not vasomotor rhinitis. You can tell the doctor you, got, um, you, you need to have some uh, nasal corticosteroids. Uh, huh? Or you corp, yeah. You got it. <laughs> well, the nasal, the nasal, you, you, they don't, don't pick it up systemically when you put it in the nose. So, and I've used it for years. Uh, well, I have to take your word for it because uh, my, the success in my uh, my practice is, you know, it's. Yeah, I will. Yeah, really, I, I want to try it. Okay, so now we're going to expand this adult. Slow expansion from here to here is by moving the maxilla outward and with a Schwartz appliance. And I've gained as much as, well, let's show you here. Five millimeters. Again, Notice the uh, tori palatini, it, it creases in the tongue, the lingual version of these teeth, how they're going into crossbite and going in towards the tongue. What's the etiology of this? It's that. Okay, now if you send them out and you're gonna have that removed, you better equilibrate that, those teeth because it's, that's what's causing it. It's buttressing bone, all right? because it will come back. Again, th this is a sleep apneic patient that I've treated, exostosis. After, I got, uh, after she had that exostosis removed, where her tongue is, 
she was no longer uh, apneic. And look at these kids here. You think that's from bottle feeding and thumb sucking? Not really. It's from adenoid problems and, t and tonsils. Again, this is a th thumb sucker uh, along with mouth breathing because this tooth is f uh, further ahead than, than uh, that tooth in labial version. Look at the roof of the mouth, how high it is. Is what? Oh, yeah. Oh, listen, if they breastfeed, they're not going to have that. You bet you they're not. You you got it. In fact, uh, the first thing I ask them, is his child breastfed? Or was he breastfed? <laughs> 16-year-old kid. <laughs> Again, look at it from the front now. And notice that it is you, not unilateral, but bilateral crossbite. Again, what are you going to do? You're going to have them bite down. Then you're going to ask them to relax their chin and bring their jaw, which will bring their jaw even. And here you, you can see that the cuspid, the deciduous cuspid, the maxillary arch is narrower than the, uh, are not unilateral. They result from a narrow maxillary arch. Uh, treatment, uh, early treatment of crossbites prevents asymmetry between the condyle, which is it, it forming, and the uh, ramus of the lower jaw. Again, relax. Gosh, dang, I put in a Schwartz, and in six weeks, I've got him out of crossbite. Would you say this is high vault? Well, when you're using it, when you're, you're expanding it, just take your acrylic burr and just reduce this here because it will drop on a child that's growing. Identical twins. And I paid to have uh, the tonsils taken out on one. Which one did I pay for five and a half months later after surgery? This one was looked at that one and said, hey, Dr. Gary, I want my tonsils and adenoids out. And I said, I'll pay for them. And I did. And I've got these pictures to prove that the adenoids and tonsils, especially the tonsils, uh, are being removed. It does cause the lips to move back. 50% of the children with two allergic patients develop an allergy. The incident decreases to 30% with one allergic patient. Contactants? Oh, yeah. Have you tried uh, reducing the tonsils with neurofarm? Yes, I have, and it didn't work. Yes, I did. Anyway, um, uh, what I want, I want, I don't want to have to take time to watch them to, to, to uh, in, d d dissolve, atrophy. I want to see it do it, I want it now. Again, we've got our foods. Allergies are the most common cause of chronic rhinitis leading to nasal hyperfunction and tissue inflammation, which leads to nasal congestion, rhinorrhea, nasal obstruction, and pruritus. Allergic edema, the nasal and paranasal mucosa, produces excessive inspissated secretions which affect cilia locomotion. Inhib inhibition of cilia locomotion results in bacterial stagnation within the nasal capsule, resulting in chronic rhinitis. Bacteria you are actually a culture within the nasal capsule. The result is a child with chronic sore throats and earaches. Cilia beat 10 to 20 times a second and collect dust, bacteria, viruses, pollens, transporting them to the pharynx where the collection is swallowed and eliminated. Cilia transport can be measured with indigo carmine, saccharin sodium, which I used to do a lot when I first started practicing, and a drop is placed in the anterior nasal cavity. After three minutes, the patient's instructed to swallow every 30 seconds and report any perception of sweet taste. Posterior pharyngeal wall is inspected for the appearance of blue dye. Mucus transport time, MTT, is normal 10 to 15 minutes. Greater than 30 minutes is considered abnormal. Tonsils and adenoids are lymphoid structures and play a role in immunologic host defense, specifically in the aerodigestive tract. In a healthy child, tonsils and adenoids begin to involute and atrophy 
at approximately the age of five and by puberty are barely evident in the healthy child. However, allergic patient with chronic rhinitis continues to maintain the tonsils, which often become hypertrophied from continuous excessive antibody and immune globulin A production. Chronic infections with the nasal cavity or capsule in children result in a response by lymphoid tissues, <laughs> tonsils and adenoids, and uh, resulting in hyperplasia. Tonsillar hypertrophy uh, proprioceptively displaces the tongue due to airway obstruction from hypertrophied adenoidal tissue. Now here's what you got to get. It, it comes from the American Academy of Head and Neck Surgery. All your ENT men are, uh, have, uh, are uh, members of this. And they developed a quality imp improvement committee, QI, continual improvement in, in the improvement of in the uh, clinical in indicators is an ongoing project of the QI. On page 19, here's our, here's where we, put a, a history, you got to have one. Hypertrophy causing dental malocclusions or adversely affecting oral facial growth documented by a dentist. Yay, baby. I, I show that to my ear, nose, and throat specialist, and he went crazy. All faces do not normalize following an adenoid tonsillectomy without orthodontic intervention. However, the earlier an infant and or child becomes a functioning nose breather, the less the orofacial deformity will occur. The stigmata, which is a clinical sign you see in a child, will be evident in the adult if untreated. If you can't recognize the stigmata, you'll never know when or where to refer. So the stigmata of respiratory tract allergies, the therapy may change, but clinical signs will never change. Again, an open mouth habitus is common in infants with allergic edema in the upper airway. This three-month-old baby, allergic to cow's milk, showed a nasal smear of 4 plus eosinophilia. Infants are obligate nose breathers for the first six months following parturition. And I think that the fact that they can't breathe through their nose uh, or their mouth is indicative of upper airway obstruction in the nose. And that's the cause of what I call crib to death. And I've watched, I, I went down to uh, the uh, morgue and happened to see 10 babies. And they didn't have hypertrophy of the turbinates, but they did have petechiae, which is red, which is a result of uh, forced breathing. And uh, they all had it. They all had it. No, you never want to be a mouth breather. Never. You, no, never. Except when you're exercising naturally. In utero. Okay. okay. The gaping child appearance of this child is a four-year-old child with perennial rhinitis since one year of age. This child has been a mouth breather for six since six, six months of age. Look at the roof of her mouth, how high it is, and look at the septum. You know, how many of you just lift the tip of the nose up? And if the septum comes out, you've got to tell them that they've got a deviated septum and they should see an ear, nose, and throat specialist. Again, narrow arches. This is a narrow arch, an A at USC, but a C and you know, an, an F, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, this is arch is narrow, and it should be horseshoe. And there's no room for the tongue in that patient. Again, now, 508 boys, 577 girls were studied in by Galvez and Mentheno, Mentanito, and this is 1989, all with upper airway obstruction. 85.8% had high palatal vault with incompetent lips. 65.3% of class three malocclusions had a high palatal vault. 79.5% of those with crossbites had a high palatal vault. And 80.2% 80 with known allergies had a high palatal vault. American Journal of Orthodontics, Dental Facial Orthopedics. Results from a mouth open to a mouth closed was associated with greater mandibular growth expressed here at the chin in both sexes, 
greater facial growth expressed in the mid face, that's between subnasality and glabella, and nasal airflow, airflow increased for both sexes. Mandibular uh, maxillary mode of uh, uh, maxillary growth after change of mode of breathing, all done by Woodside, Aronson, Anderson, Lindstrom. 38 children were studied during the five years after adenoidectomy for correction of severe nasal pharyngeal obstruction. Mandibular growth was measured at successive Natheon points and superimposed on radiographs. The downward and forward displacement uh, was approximately three millimeters greater than in the control animals, for, uh, on the control for both sexes. Buccinator mechanism, uh, your tongue's got to be inside your teeth. Gary's dogmatic dictum. All chronic mouth breathers develop a malocclusion. You cannot be a mouth, chronic mouth breather and have stable teeth, stable occlusion. Therefore, it is essential that an upper airway evaluation be performed prior to initiating and uh, orthodontics, prosthodontics, periodontics, etc. Venous puddling. What causes venous puddling? Veins of the maxilla, especially the dental arches and adjacent structures anastomose freely with the veins of the paranasal and nasal cavities that empty into the pterygoid plexus. Okay. Edema of the allergic uh, of the allergic mucous membranes of the nose and the sinuses interferes with venous drainage causing venous puddling in the dental alveoli and surrounding tissues with ensuing local tissue anoxia and acidosis. A common clinical sign is a white stippling you got on your permanent teeth. In other words, if you guys look in there and you see his white marks on the front teeth, they were allergic when they were young during the formation of those permanent teeth. Again, notice the allergic shiners on her and on me and on you. So, uh, the allergic uh, shiner uh, uh, in a four-year-old child with pronounced perennial rhinitis, dis the discoloration of the lower, lower orbital palpable grooves is caused by venous stasis. Anatomy pathogenesis of allergic shiners, the allergic edematous mucosa mucous membrane of the nasal and paranasal cavities produce pressure on the marginal venous arcades. Medial palpable veins, inferior ophthalmic veins. Pressure on these veins interfere with drainage backwards and downward to the pterygoid plexus, producing discoloration. That's me, discoloration. Allergic shiners, the allergic shiners in an eight-year-old child. Notice the, the characteristic profile on this kid here. Dolicocephalic face, roll lower lip, open mouth habitus, dry lower lip, heavy mentalis muscle, allergic shiners, In a, the uh, anatomy and pathogenesis of infraorbital edema, it's this muscle here going into spasm from an allergy. Okay. Uh, discoloration of the infraorbital uh, foramen, uh, infraorbital edema, I mean, uh, it's, it's bags b below the eye, eyes. Uh, re recurrent interstitial uh, inflammation of the tarsal conjunctiva. That's a conjunctiva under your eyelid. And uh, what it does, and that's not, I never lift up an uh, eyelid uh, except to take the picture. Limbal vernal conjunctiva is, is the, the exudate from that um, allergic response to the tarsal. Uh, uh, tarsal conjunctiva. Okay, you, this part you don't need to know. Muddy injected conjunctiva in a girl 14 years of age with perennial rhinitis since the age of three. Long silky eyelashes are often seen in allergic children. This 12 year old boy has had perennial rhinitis and bronchial asthma since the age of three. Airway obstruction in the child is usually a result of enlarged tonsils and or adenoids, whereas obstruction in the adult is usually from responsive turbinates. In the adult, turbinates are extremely responsive to allergens. As a result, a vasomotor rhinitis is produced, which must be distinguished from turbinate hypertrophy. Again, look up the nose. 
if you don't have a nasal speculum, get one. But enter the no the inter in interior of the nose showing a swollen pinkish gray mucus, mucus. And that's the anterior border of the inferior turbinate. How many of you licked up a nose? You just concentrate on teeth, don't you? Well, look up a nose, and this is what you'll see. And then if you see that, have them open their mouth and check the back of their throat. Again, which side was the side that, that the tonsil was enlarged on? That side, you're correct. Hey, very good. Now, if you got someone who does this, they, they have a, a nasal obstruction when breathing through their nose, have them s breathe in real uh, heavy, heavy like this, and look at their nose. And if, it, if it's that way, then I take breathe rights and I put them on there and I put in an upper Schwartz appliance. Um, hello, the patient, this is an allergic salute. The patient pushes on the nose with the heel of the hand to relieve the edematous turbinates, thus permitting an ingress of air. This 11-year-old child has had perennial rhinitis since the age of two. That's when it was diagnosed. I bet you it was right when she got born, when she was at birth. Transverse nasal crease on this six-year-old child, result of two years of pronounced saluting. Saluting. Again, transnasal crease, close up of the transnasal crease on a 14-year-old girl with perennial allergic rhinitis. G gaping appearance. This looks like a sick child, doesn't it? Allergic shiners. Open mouth habitus. Rolled dry lower lip. Upper lip arched. Long silky eyelashes. Well, you don't. You can't see that on that. Grimace momentarily relieves it, itching. Mouth wrinkling to a relieve itching. Geographic tongue. Geographic tongue becomes very, very sensitive during allergies, and then disappears when the allergy is no longer there. And uh, my son was allergic to uh, bananas. Uh, and every time he'd have a banana, he'd have an allergy. He'd have this pain in his tongue. Again, geographic tongue, 10-year-old boy with perennial rhinitis, bronchial asthma. Note the serpentine markings. They're usually migratory. Again, scallop tongue. How many of you notice it's have gotten marked? You know, okay, good for you. Because this is the result of a scallop tongue. Diastema. Perio problems. Uh, no, note the hyperplastic lymphoid follicles on the posterior wall of the pharynx due to constant postnasal drip. The 16-year-old has had perennial rhinitis since birth. Hyperema of the pharynx. Well, we all know that that's from chronic mouth breathing. Barrel chest emphysema. Barrel chest configuration. Uh, this nine-year-old boy with severe bronchial asthma since infancy. Pulmonary function studies usually confirm emphysematous changes in the lung. Large anthracranial polyp extending into the nasal pharynx of 11-year-old child with a two-year history of snoring cured with surgery. Marginal upper eyelid is eczema, 10-year-old boy with marginal upper eyelid eczema with marked blepharitis. And they rub it. And that becomes a sty. So the 13-year-old has conjunctivitis, secondarily to grass po the secondary to grass pollenosis, marked itching and rubbing of the eyes, uh, cause an ordeolum of the left l eyelid and on the, the right eyelid. Gingival hyperplasia. Notice the excoriated nose here, and from cuspid to cuspid, deciduous cuspid we've got hypertrophied tissue. Bruxism in children. In, in infants at three years of age, the reason they bruxate, that they brux, is to allow the medial pterygoid to rub against the t tensor villi palatini. And that gives them a momentary relief of all the pressure in their eustachian tube. Again, it's the rubbing of that, it's the proximity of that uh, 
ten, uh, medial pterygoid to the tensor villi palatini at the insertion of the pterygoid plate. Uh, again, bruxism in children. Usually you can tell what side they sleep on. Um, this guy here, he had gold crowns placed on the back. And I doubt if they wore down too much, but I think that what we have here is an overclosure here, habitual occlusion and neuromuscular occlusion. And if I build this bite to this, his, to this uh, vertical, his symptoms would not disappear. And his symptoms were uh, headaches, pain behind the eye, pain in the ears, and fullness in the ears. Oh, the more you, li the heavier the weights, the more you. EMG recordings are going to to uh, in increase in their amplitude and frequency. Uh, maxillary sinus polyps are frequently seen on the floor of the antra, and uh, appearing smooth brown masses, which is the arrow here. And they're, they're the polyps like these are asymptomatic and require no surgical intervention unless they got a mucus seal that is going to invade the cella tersica. Again, mucus seal of the patient, as, and the slide is shown one year later than this, okay, and uh, causing a frequency of, of headaches and mucus seal was surgically removed. Oh, the sounds of an ear are intermittent, hearing difficulties, popping of the ears, feeling of fullness in the head, vertigo tinnitus, uh, Nasal speech, mouth breathing, coughing spells follow, followed by wheezing, <laughs> uh, constant clearing of the throat, frequent gulping, low pitch uh, frog like croak, and snapping sounds during sleep, tracheal clicks. Now, this is important, the slide here. Upper airway of manifestations, uh, uh, upper respiratory allergic manifestations may include. Hyperkinesis. My God, I've had patients, uh, the teachers call me and say, I no longer have to put them on Ritalin. What do you got them on? I said, that new oxygen, the new, the new uh, drug oxygen. Malay, subpar intellectual achievement, lowered exercise tolerance, behavioral disorders that should be up with hyperkinesis, snoring, obstructive sleep apnea, lowered oxygen saturation, Lower production of pituitary growth hormone, and that to us is our immune system. Poor eating habits, nutritional depletion, pulmonary hypertension, core pulmonality, fitful sleeping, and bedwetting. Bedwetting. For that, that's from fitful sleeping. Important. Now, prolonged, mouth, prolonged chronic mouth breathing leads to one, malocclusion. Two, poor tongue repose. Three, dry bulbous lips. Four, pseudokylosis, angulokylosis. That's uh, the, uh, the, the modiolum of the mouth. Um, speech defects, lisping, uh, dental lisping, lateral lisping, chronic hyperemia, the pharynx, snoring, sleep apnea, lowered pulmonary oxygen saturation, blood saturation important. What's the function of the nose? It warms the air, moistens the air, filters the air, provides optimal respiration, uh, re respiratory on ex exhalation. In other words, when you breathe in, you fill up the lung. It's when you breathe out, you get the, ex the uh, exchange of gases. If you're a mouth breather, is that going to uh, inhibit the, uh, is it going to increase the pressure of you ha of uh, breathing out yeah, it will. So it, it's resistance when you breathe out. And olfaction. 32% of children with chronic allergy develop a deviated septum resulting in sens from sensitization to cow's milk in infancy and early feeding of adult type ingredients. Again, nasal septum. Standing allergic patient. Again, look at this arch here, and 22-year-old 22 22 year in treatment for 10 years. 
Well, let's take a look at this and see what happens. This arch looks pretty good, doesn't it? Son of a gun. But the tongue is large. Oh, my God, the tongue's causing that. What's the cause? It's deviated septum. And I sent him out for septoplasty and a, a, a trivenectomy. And, they, and you want to send him to a ear, nose, and throat specialist that understands it. You don't take out, out the bone. You become a mouth breather when you take out the bone of the turbinates. They're conch. Sh they're formed like a sh snail, and they're covered with hypertrophied tissue. And you just remove the hypertrophied tissue. Again, three-year-old child. Notice that. Boy, 15. Girls, 21 years of age. Woman, 40 years of age. She'd seen a dentist. He'd never talk to her about her nose. Traumatic birth pressures can create a deviated septum. It should be corrected within the first three days after parturition. If not, the septum will remain deviated for the rest of the life. Whoever designed that hole didn't go through it. <laughs> because I'm telling you, There is, there is trauma. There is trauma to the nose. Now, differential diagnosis between a cold and an allergy. What you do is you take temperature at 4 p.m. and again at 8 p.m. It's a primary clue to differentiate a cold from allergy because allergies do not excite the immune system. Therefore, the patient's temperature is normal if an allergy is the cause of the patient's complaints. Again, how much can you identify there? Tear, tear, tearing eyes, long silky eyelashes, nasal cavities, pretty good, open mouth habitus, roll lower lip, deep labial middle fold, heavy mentalis muscle, and an arched upper lip. You gonna look for that? You bet you you are. You're gonna send them to the proper way. Now, what have you learned? The value of breastfeeding, the dangers of conventional bottle feeding, the dangers of appendage sucking, how the tongue affects the development of the dental arches, the sphincter action of the buccinator mechanism, how the tongue accommodates by proprioception, how to recognize an allergic patient, and the dangers of chronic mouth breathing. The most significant principle to understand is that the teeth seek a neutral position within a system of forces acting on them. The force system changes constantly during growth, and teeth move in response to stimuli from their, in their environment. Clinical observation can, with experience, enable a dentist to assess the force system in a child or adult and determine whether the position of the teeth may improve or deteriorate when balance between the dentition and force system has been established. It's rewarding to relieve pain, improve facial cosmetics, create dental aesthetics, and develop a stable neuromuscular occlusion. Las Vegas Institute, oh man, I'm at that institute at least three times a month. Uh, and I, I think I've met some of you in there uh, when, I walk, when I've walked through the, the hallways. But thank you for your courteous attention, and uh, God bless all of you. Question. Yeah, okay, yeah, question. It depends on the. How do you inform the patient and what they should expect? Do you read the information? I let the, the, dent, the, the ENT man explain that. But I do tell him this that if it's done properly, there'll be a little blood loss, and the child will be out the next day with uh, being able to eat. And, uh, what was the question? Oh. Uh, oh, yeah. Except, you know, the, the fellow that's skilled with the scalpel, he'll never go to laser. And uh, you can't lose a, use a laser for the adenoids either. So it's, it's done blindly. Doctor, this is so important. Uh, my problem is finding your nose and throat that will take the tonsils out. 
Okay. I have to refer my patients from Reno to Vegas. There's a gentleman that does it for me in Vegas. He's very good. He doesn't even ask questions anymore because I mean, this, this is dramatic, what the doctor shows you today. I mean, I have seen 60-year-old patients who get lymphomas from chronic tonsillitis, cancers, constant lymphomas. And kids with, with asthma, even teenagers, the next day the asthma is pretty much gone. This is crucial stuff, and I know we all like to keep teeth like root canals, but they, I think tonsils are even worse than root canals. Once they're infected, they're shot. They have to go. And they affect the posture of the tongue and the oral cavity, too. What's uh, Pierre Robin syndrome? Isn't that an, an exacerbation? Oh, yeah. In fact, the picture that they dis they show a face that's protruded here, retruded here, shoulders forward. Uh, in uh, everything is caved in here, and uh, the knees are bent, and they call it uh, glossoptesis, which means there's no room for the tongue. Do you ever do you ever do an aspiration of a tonsil to find out you know tripping up tripping tonsillitis and aspiration to send it in? Not me, but I do let I do have my uh, uh, ENT men do it. I use Dr. Chu and Dr. Lombardo and Dr. Bui, B U I. Where are they in Vegas or Fullerton? And they're in Fullerton and Anaheim and in Irvine. In Vegas is Dr. Scott Manti, M A N T H E I, will do this. Mm. You know, you need to give this lecture to the ear, nose, and throat. Guys, they need to I, d I did in Orange County. As a matter of fact, when I got up to <coughs> make my presentation, the uh, president whispered in my ear, he said, a lot of these are going to uh, are going to leave now, and I said, "Well, it's because I'm a dentist." No, no, they're just here to get their ha their hour and a half uh, CME credit. And uh, I said, "Well, gee whiz, uh, let me go back here." And I had slides at that time, and I took the slides of showing the uh, tonsils and the and the uh, the way they affect the arch, and not one of them left. Not one of them left. They all came up and congratulated me. Yeah, I know it. I know it. I know it. I know it. And as your teeth move microns, your body will pick that up. You know, you can tell by your EMG recordings. And uh, you may be, you might be right on today, but off tomorrow. So, um, does she have that? Did she have the uh, Mayo data or M MD data? TMD data folder. I've got two monographs in there, all with references. Naturally, you got to believe what I say. I got to refer. Oh yeah, that's it. Uh, and uh, yes. No, gee, gods, I wish they had them available here in the LVI. Okay. And they have been sold, but that's the order prices right here, and it was Okay. And we bought the three, you know, the three special, I think it was 99 or something. Yeah, I've, you know, you have to take this at my my word. But I've got all that stuff referenced in there, in, in the back. Ni 98 references. Doctor, what's the only day that you use your, uh, your neuromuscular appliances on the uh, um, I, do, I don't use kids. Um, I, I mean, I do it on children. But I, what I do at birth is that if they've got a, uh, they're grinding their teeth, I'll put them on the Nooksauger Exerciser, which is a flat, round one. And watch what happens in three months. They'll stop their their brooks. But I give them a tonsillectomy. I have to have a tonsillectomy. Would it would it nuts exercise work for a ton an animal? Uh, not not only that, uh, but you know you take your elastics, okay? Give them a handful. Tell them you're gonna you want them to take the tip of your tongue and put it up in the incisive papilla, and swallow without swallowing the rubber. Now when they can do that, then you have them swap, eat, uh, and they'll come back and they'll say, hey, look, I can do it, and they'll show you. And then you take and have them chew up a sugarless cookie and uh, put it, 
and put it in the center of their tongue, and then hold that rubber and, and, and uh, the incisive papilla and swallow without, uh, without their tongue, without dropping the elastic, okay? Now, for their lips, the, the, to increase it, take a 2.5 centimeter button, an inch button, put it one on each end of a string, and have them put it between their lips and their teeth, and they're going to have a tug of war against their sibling or their mother or their father. And when they can pull it out of their mother and father's mouth, I usually tell them I'm going to give you a reward, a surprise. And they do, they do work with, uh, you know, the siblings are, are uh, they're competitive. And uh, the one sibling wants to beat the other one. And if you put the button behind the mouth of the sibling that's not a tongue thruster, the, the lips, uh, and then have them pull on the other end of the string, pull it out of the other sibling's mouth, Th that thing will go up in so much pressure, poundage per, per square inch. And I got a strain gauge that I use. Dr. Joseph Easels has, uh, in his second book, the 13th chapter in that book is called The Significance of the Head Focus in the Cancer Process. And uh, the reprint of that is available from uh, Carol. And uh, the first part of the chapter is the relationship between cancers and root canals that he discovered. And the second half of the chapter is all about tonsils. And there's an excellent scenario in there on how to determine with a chronically infected tonsil on when to remove it and when you can treat it. Very good. I think your knowledge is extremely important in integrated management. Have, what kind of effort have you made so far to contribute uh, to, you know, like into the integrated management part? This is my first experience with biologic dentists. Uh, I did go to some uh, nu nutritional uh, factor, uh, you know, uh, meetings, associated meetings, the academy, and uh, I did try to tell them that TMJ is not uh, going to be treated by herbs. It's a bite b problem, and if they could show me the herb that they changed the bite on, I'd give them a thousand dollars. Yeah, I still got it. <laughs> My question is turning to uh, after, you, after you've increased the vertical dimension, what kind of alternative is possible other than grounding those teeth? Ortho. Ortho or, or on an, uh, an adult, an 88 year old, semi permanent orthotic. But after they've worn the temporary orthotic, the splint, temporary splint orthotic at a neuromuscular position. You want them to wear 24-7 uh, and even chew with it. Not take it out when, they, not when they're sleeping and not when they're eating, but uh, take it out immediately after they eat, brush their teeth, brush it, put it right back in. Because you want to know when you're building them to that position that they're going to be stable without pain, without symptoms. Well. Golly gee whiz. Yeah. Okay. And also, I had a bulldog bite when 